It's so good to see you here today. Merry Christmas to you. I am so honored and privileged that you have chosen to spend what is like one of the most family-oriented traditional times of the year, and you've chosen to spend that time with us. I'm really grateful for that, and I don't want to squander that opportunity. I want to give you some life today from God's Word. Is anybody ready for that today? Come on. Is anybody? Is anybody? I almost said morning. I promised myself. I wasn't going to say good morning one time tonight, but uh, I'm, still, I'm still doing pretty good. I'm still hanging in there, still doing really well. We have a mission here at the church, and it's always prevalent. It's always forefront of my mind whenever I stand up here to preach, and it goes, we are to be a lifeline by leading people and becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. There are notes that are available in the YouVersion Bible app if you like, but, but I want to talk to you about most of all, like one of the most important things I have to share with you is next week, actually, the week after tomorrow. So tomorrow, no church. You, you stay home with your, your family. It's going to be great. You're going to open presents. It's going to be wonderful. You're going to love it. But the week after that, January 1st is a Sunday. Sunday, January 1st. You've never had a better opportunity ever in your life to say, God, I'm putting my, I'm putting my first foot right with you because January 1st, I'm going to church. Like it's always like the second or the the sixth, you know, it's like already a few days in, but this is a really special year because we get to start our year with God and giving giving glory to God and honoring him. And I know a lot of people that would say, man, I want to be a new year, new me. Come on, anybody ever heard anybody say that? New year, fresh, fresh start, man. Yeah. And every single preacher in the whole world has got a, a sermon title like that. And I'm no different. I've got one called Refresh. Refresh. That's right. We are going to start this brand new series called Refresh. And I believe it could be, absolutely, 2023 could be the best year of your life if it's the best year of your life spiritually. If we learn to focus on God and put him first and begin to honor him above everything else, we would learn that everything else would fall into place. Everything else would begin to make sense and everything would add up just the way that we always wanted it to if we would just learn to put him first. And so I I think it's a wonderful opportunity for every single one of us to say, you know what, I'm going to start my year off right I'm going to start my year off by watching the East Coast uh, New Year's Eve ball drop so I can get to bed at nine. (laughs) I just helped somebody go to bed earlier. I just helped somebody. I only learned about that a few years ago, that I could actually watch it live. I don't know where I was. I always thought I had to be up at midnight, but then I got a little bit older, you know, and I'm just like finding ways, finding ways to go to bed earlier. So do it that way so that you can show up on January 1st. And this series is going to be absolutely game changing. You can start your one year Bible plan on that first day. You can start the year off hearing a message from God's word next week. Don't miss it. Refresh is starting. And I I would love the opportunity to start this year off, this new season of your life. And bring somebody. If you know someone who needs this, know someone who's looking for a fresh start of some kind, a refresh, someone who's been dealing with some struggle, you know, they have a lack of. They have a lack of refreshment in their life. It's because they don't have a connection. That's what that refresh button is for, you know, is to refresh things in our life. But without a proper connection to God, you can't get the refreshment that you need. Oh boy, it's going to be good. I'm very, very excited about it. But let's, let's, let's focus on the task at hand. Now, today I want to talk to you a little bit about this, this concept where we're consolidating everything that we've learned all month long about these, the ghosts of Christmas past, the things that have held us back, the things that have hurt us, the things that, that tend to come up during these times of the year that make our life a struggle, that make our, life, our lives tense and, and depressing and the things that hold us down. And, and one of the main things that, where this happens is disappointment. Disappointment. What do you do when you feel disappointed by God? Without a show of hands, maybe you've been there. Maybe you know what it feels like to feel disappointed by God. How about, let me just uh, take us back in time to, um, I don't know, maybe September 11th? Uh, several years ago when we woke up in the morning one morning, at least I did, I woke up and I looked at the TV screen and my whole life had turned upside down just like that and I didn't know what my future held, just like that, instantly. How about just a couple years ago, 2020, 
when we, when we were planning our new year. Oh, yeah, tight, 2020 vision. This is going to be awesome. This is going to be my year. Oh, come on, somebody. And then next thing you know, you're like, oh, whoa, what happened? What, homeschooling, what? I don't know how to do that. Oh, I don't, can't even go out to a restaurant. I had all kinds of plans, but my plans got derailed. We've been shown over and over again in life that we can be let down by when we make plans and we think life is going to go one way, but then life goes a completely, it takes a turn for us. And then we're left feeling disappointed in God. So what do you do when you feel disappointed in God? Like he, he lets you down or he missed the mark. Maybe you raised your kids the best you knew how, but now they're making decisions that you know ain't right. That you know that this is going to lead to a, a bad outcome in their life. Maybe you didn't plan homeschooling, but here you are three years later still doing it. And you're the, you're the principal, you're the teacher, and you're the, um, the, the lunch lady. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe you're single this year and you didn't plan on being single this year. That was not in the plan. My plan was not to be single this year. Or maybe you're single again and that wasn't the plan this year. Maybe you're struggling with, maybe it's even more serious. Maybe you are struggling with some depression, some loss, some things we've already talked about all month long. Maybe you're spending Christmas without a family. Maybe this is the closest thing you have to a family this Christmas. And that's why I'm glad we, uh, that's why I'm just every time, every time we gather together, I'm grateful and I'm humbled and I'm honored that we have this, that this is a blessing. I'm, I'm grateful that we have this because I'm just reminded of where my life was at one time and I didn't, I didn't have this. Like I, I didn't have my, my friends, my, my brothers and my sisters, the people that we, we love each other. We go through ups and downs together. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. I'm reminded again tonight that we have this and I'm, I'm grateful for it. But what do you do when you feel like God has let you down? So this is going to be the Christmas story and maybe a twist that you haven't heard before, but I'm going to run it down to you. All right, Luke 2. Luke 2 is probably the classic Christmas story. In Luke 2, it had been 400 years since the people of God have heard anything from from him. You know, they used to have prophets that were, that were hearing things all the time. It was wonderful. Malachi was written, lots of wonderful wisdom there. But then 400 years, that's like the last thing God's saying to his people coming across on the Mayflower or something like that, plus or minus a couple hundred years. You know what I'm saying? It's a long time. 400 years is a long time. And there was nothing going on. 400 years. And then one moment, shepherds are in a field, taking care of their flocks. Boom. And an angel of the Lord shows up and says, check it out. We're starting it up again. Here we go. Message from the Lord. And it's not just any message. It's not just something going on. The angel of the Lord appears and says in Luke 2, starting in verse 10, he says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news. Come on. Who's ready for good news today? Is anybody? And wave at me if you're ready for some good news. Finally. Come on. Some good news these days. Let's go. The Savior. Ooh. The Savior, that's got a ring to it. The Savior, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. What I love about God is if we, if we just needed some advice, he would have sent a counselor. If we just needed a little education, he would have sent a teacher. If we just needed more laws, he would have sent a politician. But God knew that we needed forgiveness. We needed hope. We needed healing. So guess what? He sent a Savior, a Messiah, Something that rises to the top and is greater, holier, better than anything we could have ever asked for or imagined. He sent Jesus. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful. And then it says this. It says, and you will recognize him by this sign that you will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. A sign, a sign, and it's an object that conveys meaning. Y'all know this. You know what a sign is, but it's an object that, that conveys meaning, sends a message. The sign was not that it was going to be a, a king in a palace dressed in purple robes with like this halo and he's just like gracing in, you know, kind of like how Tiffany comes up on stage. <laughs> you know, she comes up on stage sometimes and she's just like, like draped behind her is the glory cloud. I don't know what it's like. Maybe it's just me because I love her so much. Maybe it's just me. Every opportunity I get, hon, every opportunity I get. No, 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 no. You know what the sign would be is, is, is this baby is going to be born in a hollowed out cave. 
That's what the sign is. This baby, I'm, I'm serious. This is, this is what really happened. You know, we've got these cute little uh, mini figs that we, put on our, that we put on our nightstand and we put it like on the coffee table and it's like, a little, it's like a little baby. He's so comfortable, so comfortable in this little hay bed. And then everybody's there. You know, the shepherds are there. Wise men are there. Why are they there? Who knows? doesn't matter. Throw them in. They're a little made of It's so perfect. But what the real story is, is Jesus will probably like right next to a little pile of poo. Okay, it was, it, I'm, it was stinky, uncomfortable. This is the sign. Wrapped in, in, in cloth, but like if you look into it, those are the same kind of cloths that he was wrapped in that they would wrap dead people in. The, sa- the same kind of cloth. And it was a sign. It was a sign that this, this baby was born to die. Born to die. Now, I mean, everybody's born to die. We all got to go sometime. But this baby was born to die. That's, that was the sign. That was the sign. Heavenly royalty born to die. Luke 2, 13 and 14. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Peace on earth. Wait a second. Hang on a second. Y'all read the Bible before? All right, you live in the same world as I do? Peace on earth, what are you talking about? What are they gonna see? They're not gonna see that. They're gonna, same, what, this, they're gonna see the same thing that you and I see all the time, anything but peace, and most often, disappointment. Disappointment. Getting real in church today. We're gonna see some disappointment. But there's hope hidden in the Christmas story. I'm going to start this off by, by just kind of describing the story. It's, it's a gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching story about a young couple, all right, a young couple that deals with betrayal, deceit, uh, relational devastation. And when we talk about Mary and Joseph, these are not just names. These are real people. Mary and Joseph, real people. There's a lot of couples in here today. Mary and Joseph were a couple. They were a couple of kids about to get married, and their life got flipped, turned upside down. I'm glad that some of you liked that. Um, that makes me happy. That, that's, that was my Christmas gift right there, is that I got a couple chuckle off. <laughs> that was, now I'm good. They, they were unfairly criticized, they hated, shamed, humiliated, they, and Jesus experienced a traumatic birth. This was really like a nightmare going on. They, they had to run. They were fugitives on the run. This story is tragic. These are not just names. These are people that had to deal with all these things. Why? Because they were doing what God told them to do. And that's not fair. That's something I hate with kids in the house. That's something I hear a lot. Not fair. Not fair. And then what do you want to say to them? That's right. That's what it's not. And I'm the one that makes it not fair just to put it on you because it's not fair for me. It's not going to be fair for you. And now it's fair. Now it's fair. Now it's fair. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a good parent. I'm, I'm a good parent. I really am. Nobody believe. Oh, that's all right. I'll just move. All right, let's modernize this story a little bit. Let's call uh, Joe. Let's call him Joe. Let's call Joseph Joe because most people named Joseph are called Joe. Now, it's kind of coming back. I was going to, uh, let's call Mary Mary. Mary's fine. May May. No, let's not call her that. That's, what's modern about that? That's, okay, the names are fine. Joe and Mary. We'll just stick like that. And let's just, let's paint the picture a little bit. Let's modernize. Is it okay if I modernize this story a little bit? The Christmas story, you're going to hear it today, but it's a little bit modernized. This is how it went down. Joe and Mary, and Joe's taking her out. Man, let's go for a walk, babe. Let's go for a walk on the Bethlehem Bridge. Yeah, I got something. I got something planned. And then he's walking around, and then he's like, bam, all right. But the photographer was like hidden in like one of, behind some of the rocks, you know, and like maybe one of the huts. I don't know, what did they have back then, huts? So he kept pops out and ch- ch- perfect pictures, perfect pictures on the Bethlehem Bridge. She posted to Instagram, record number of likes, blessed. Hashtag blessed right there. Her, her, her page is blowing up. Everybody's like, oh, I'm so, so jealous of you. All of her girlfriends are like, oh my God, he's so sweet. You're so lucky. It's just going, per- she is just all over the moon. They got big plans. They got big plans. They're going to get married in May because if you're proper, you get married in May. That's, I mean, is that, is that normal? I got married in, in January, so that's just like what we could afford at the time. <laughs> Honeymoons are cheaper when you get married in January. That's, a, that's, a, that's free. That's free advice for some of you out there. But they're going to get married in May. They're going to get married in May. 
a lot of, a lot of weddings coming up. This is going to be great. Honey, their honeymoon was going to be an all-inclusive resort stay in Rome. They're going to Rome, going to stay there for free. It's really not that far, so it wasn't a big deal. <laughs> Sounds good to us. They had plans, all right? They're going to pay off Joe's uh, trade school loan. All right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pay off his trade school loan. He's a bit of a carpenter, a bit of a carpenter. So they're going to pay off his loan. They're going to live in an apartment for two years. Two years. Not one, not three, two, two, two years. That's how long they're going to stay in the apartment. They're going to save, okay? And they're going to build a starter home. They're going to, he, Joe's going to do it himself because he's, like I said, good with a hammer. All right, he's going to build his own in a suburban neighborhood in Nazareth. And they're going to expand the carpentry business. Just to, and as soon as they start hiring help in the business, they're going to start having babies. That's when they're going to, because they have plans. I mean, they're, re, they're normal people, just like you and just like me. So guess what? I bet they had plans. Maybe not, maybe not like that, but something like it. I'm, I'm sure of it. God interrupts their plans and hands them the most complicated, inconvenient, untimely, seemingly unfair assignment an angel appears to a 14 slash 15 year old Mary. Like that's, she's young, but this is normal back then. Okay, so don't, don't get all weirded out. It was all good. Everything was fine. And the angel says this, you're going to give birth to a son, Jesus, <coughs> the Savior. That's who he's going to be. How? Mary says, I'm a virgin. I mean, we've done it. We've done it your way, God. Like an angel appears and like, no, I haven't slept with him, I promise. All right, did my mom send you? Like what? Like what's, what's going on? I feel like I'm getting grilled here. All right. What is it? Like the, the second century? Come on, that's so, so two centuries ago. But no, Mary's like, no, we didn't do it. We didn't, we didn't you know, consummate. Yeah, we didn't do that. But the angel's like, no, 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 no. It's not like that. I get it. You, you're good. You kept it above board. All, all great. But this baby is conceived by the Holy Spirit in you. And, and so she's, she's excited. She's like, oh, this is tight. And she says one of the most amazing things. Uh, I should have put it up on the screen because I just like, I love what she said, but I just wrote it right here. She said, may it be done unto me according to your will. I love that. I love that because it just communicates that surrender. Like, all right, Lord, whatever you say goes. I got my plans, but let it be done unto me the, the way you say. So Mary it's like Mary went off to church, had like this big, great time at church, comes home from church, and Joe's like, so what happened at church? Oh, nothing much. Pregnant. <laughs> Pregnant. Oh, but don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's a ghost. It was a ghost. The ghost did it. Just ghost did it. Don't worry. Don't, don't worry about it. It's actually, it's actually good. This is good. It's actually a good thing. And Joe's like, say, <laughs> say what? We're never going back to that church again. This is, this is not happening. This is not happening. I can't believe, like, not only did you cheat on me, I mean, not, put yourself in his shoes, guys. Not only did you cheat on me, but you are off your rocker. You are absolutely crazy. This is not right. I mean, how would you respond if your girlfriend said she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit? You'd have her committed, all right? You'd feel like burned a little bit, but like, man, she... She crazy. This is outrageous. But Matthew 1 says this. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. He's a good guy. And yet did not want to expose her publicly into disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, hang on a second. I thought you said they were engaged. Not married already. How's he going to divorce a girl that he hasn't married yet? Well, let me, I'll just coach you up a little bit, real, just as quick as I can, that in Hebrew culture back then, there's actually like two words I'm going to really try hard to pronounce correctly because I'm just a gringo and I do the best I can, all right? I just do the best I can. And there's, there's two stages of a Hebrew wedding back then, and it's uh, the Kedushin, 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 oh, jeez, I knew that was going to happen. The, the Kedushin. I think you have to say it quicker than that. Thank you, Daniel. The Kiddushin is the engagement. The Kiddushin is the engagement. And, and at that point, it's done. It's settled. Like, it's a binding agreement. It's not like now where, like, when I'm marrying people, I could be like, if you want to get out of this, blink twice. I will faint right here, and you can run off. It is all right. Because it's not done till it's done, right? It's not done. But back then, no, once you're engaged, it's locked in. Like, if the man dies... After the Kiddushin, 
Daniel's going to hate me after this. He knows how to, how to say this. I don't. But after it's all done, like after the engagement's done and the man dies, the woman's considered a widow. It's that done. And then the second part is the huppa. I like that one a lot. Huppa. The huppa. That's the marriage ceremony. That's where the marriage is, is consummated. It's also pronounced huppa huppa. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's really weird. It's the huppa. You just say it. It's huppa huppa. That's when it's all done. Okay. All right. So put it this way. They hadn't got to the huppa huppa. Yeah. They're still in the kiddushin. <laughs> They're still picking wedding colors. They're still in that zone, but it's solid. And they're, in, they're in this binding agreement, and, and Mary's now pregnant. And back then, that is an outrage. Back then, in, in their culture, like God, God knew what he was doing. I like to think he knew what he was doing. He was protecting, like violently protecting the, the integrity of his nation, of his people, and saying, no, nah, we're going we're gonna to protect the, the sexual morality and not let things, and he was just, that's just the way it was. And it was, they were good at it, uh, which I totally support. I think it's a good thing still to stay, to stay, to keep that purity as, as, as much as you can, just to get it going. And this would make him and her both, for her to be pregnant, it would make both of them outcasts forever. Like both of them are totally shamed but both, not just both of them, both of their families, like everybody, everybody is totally shamed if this got out. So he was going to divorce her quietly. So, so Joe knows they've never been intimate. Obviously he knows that. So he's crushed. He's humiliated. His life, all the plans they had ruined. I mean, imagine the invitations are out. And, and, and they call off the engagement. It's worse than the public humiliation. What about the personal betrayal? This is his best friend, the person he's supposed to spend the rest of his life with. He trusted Mary. He loved her, planned to spend his life with her. And now what? His life and her life, they're both over as he knew it. And imagine Mary, again, 14, 15 years old, didn't do anything wrong. All she did was listen to God. This is a messed up story, man. This is. The Christmas story is jacked. It's wild. She didn't do anything wrong. She did everything right. Listened to God. Saved herself. Kept herself pure. It was going to marry a good guy and then said okay to to God. Said yes to God. And is now going to be outcasted forever. Everything is breaking down. God, I said yes to you. Now Joseph hates me. Everyone hates me. My life is over. This isn't what I had planned. Maybe, maybe some of you have had a year like that or had a season like that. This is not what was supposed to happen. I wasn't supposed to lose them right now. I wasn't supposed to lose this loved one. I wasn't supposed to experience this sickness. I wasn't supposed to experience this loss. You know, maybe you had something planned like some travel, like a big reunion or, a, or a, a something and a surprise bill now has you in debt. You're not, not only are you not going to go traveling, but you're in debt now. And, and things are totally thrown off. Maybe you were expecting a promotion from work, but you actually lost your job. I mean, things don't always go as planned. Maybe you thought you'd be by, married by now, but there are no prospects, and the prospects that are out there are not going to go for it. Not going not to do that. I'd rather stay single. And that's not always a bad idea, ladies. I'm just saying, boys got to grow up too, you know. Maybe you thought by now you'd have that baby you've been planning on. You'd have that baby and you tried and you tried, but you just can't conceive. Maybe you, maybe you did, but lost the baby. And this is serious. These are serious things. You know, I'm not, I would never make light of them to you. I'm just trying to make light of a very difficult subject. Some of us have lost some things. And we had plans, and they just didn't go the way we thought they would. This isn't what I wanted. This isn't what I planned. God, I don't understand. And that's the key, isn't it? It's that we don't understand. God, what are you doing? What, where are you? When this is going on in our lives, we are tempted to ask, I don't understand. God, what, what are you thinking? Because I can't understand. I've got two truths from the word of God and out of this story that are going to help you get through a season like this in your life. Maybe you're going through now or maybe you might be going through soon. 
And the first truth is this, is you don't have to understand the plan to trust God has a purpose. You don't have to understand the plan to understand that there is a, a purpose at the end of it. And there is, there is. Watch this, Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans, everyone say plans, plans. in a person's heart, but the Lord's purpose is that which prevails. Thank God for his purpose. Thank God he has a purpose. That people's opinions can't stop his purpose. That disappointments in our life can't stop God's purpose. That mistakes that even you make can't stop God's purpose. That God's purpose prevails in all situations when we submit to him and give to him our our ununderstanding, what we don't understand, Lord, I submit to you, his purpose prevails. Listen to Matthew 1 again in, in verse 20. But after Joseph had considered this, because he was going to go off on his own plan again. He was coming up with his own plan. I'm a divorcer. But after Joseph considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, thank God, in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived as her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are gonna call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Come on, somebody, that is good news and I love it every time I hear it because I'm somebody who needs it and I'm somebody who would just love to receive it every single day because I need it every single day. Wait, what? Even in the middle of this horrible mess, even in the middle of what's going on, there's purpose in my pain because the first, the first truth is that you don't have to understand the plan to trust God has a purpose. But, but truth number two is this, your disappointment with God, your disappointment with God might actually be a divine appointment from God. Your disappointment with God might actually be a divine appointment from God. There are times when you are let down but God, you've got a purpose for that pain. God, you have a purpose for what I'm going through right now. Hindsight always tells me that, and every time I have to go through it, I have to remind myself again. God, you've got a purpose for this pain. I'm struggling right now. I'm going through this loss. I'm going through this hurt. But God, you have a purpose for this. God, somehow you're going to bring yourself glory. Somehow you're going to help someone. Somehow you're going to build this up. Somehow you're going to use me. You've got a purpose in this pain. He's got something cooking. Man, God has something cooking when you're, when you're going through something tough. Because I had a plan too. I mean, I didn't, I didn't grow up, you know, with a plan of, you know, barely dodging prison and, and having all this trouble come on my life. I mean, some of you might be a little new around here, so I, I didn't mean to startle you like that. But I had a plan too. I had a plan. My plan when I was growing up, my plan was I was going to play music for a living. And I was pretty good. I was. I could play drums with the best of them, and I could play with, with older people. We could play professionally. We could go on tour. We could go out of state. We could play. And I wanted to play music for a living. That was my plan. I, had a good, I thought it was a good plan. I didn't plan on all the stuff happening to me the, the way it happened. You know, I, and everything was going good until you know, I got introduced to the lifestyle, what music comes with. The partying, 24 Seven, everything's always a party. But by the time I was 16 years old, I quit coming home. And I figured out I could just go out and I could just have fun all day, every day, stay with whoever I wanted. It was my plan just to play music, but then my plan turned into partying every day. And by the time I was 16 years old, I was hopelessly addicted to drugs, hopelessly. Totally burned out. Total, music was gone. I wasn't worried about that at all anymore. I was only fixated on that. I got trapped by sin. I got trapped by the allure of feeling good and my own way, my own lifestyle. It's extreme for me, but it might be a little bit more subtle for some others. But I tell you, it's the same outcome. When we get allured into a life focused on self, it's, it leads to nothing but pain. Nothing but pain. I never planned on getting trapped in that, in that lifestyle. I never planned on getting sentenced to five years, eight months in prison. I never planned on getting sent to the Salvation Army instead of all that. I never planned on getting saved in a country bumpkin church in some place I'd never heard of called Stockton, California. I had never planned on relocating to Lodi 
and, and coming to just the same old country bumpkin place just like that, because showing up someplace like here and meeting a woman of, of my dreams. I've never planned on becoming a pastor here. I'd never plan on any of that. But if things went the way I planned, God wouldn't have his way. You understand what I'm saying here? That God might have a purpose in your pain. That even though it doesn't match the, the, the map that you made in your mind, that God might actually want to do something that's even bigger and greater than you had. God has wonderful imagination. And he can take all of our screw-ups and he can take all of our pain and all of our mess and all of the tragedy that we go through and he can shape it and he can move it and he can mold it and he can say, check it out. I've got a new creation here. Check it out. I've got someone who can minister to, to anyone now. Check it out. I got someone who's eternally grateful now because of what they went through. I can use them to do anything. It wasn't my plan to go through any of this. If, if my plan had gone my way, I wouldn't be married to my wife. I wouldn't have three beautiful children. And I wouldn't be preaching for the 10th time a Christmas Eve service at Lifeline Church. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be here. No, if, I, if things went my way, none of that would be going. If things had gone according to plan, none of this. I'm thankful that God has a better plan than I do. Are you beginning to see that even though things might not be going just the way that you thought for yourself, that maybe God has a purpose for you? Maybe God has a plan for you too. You've had some things not go according to plan. I understand it's painful. I understand it's hard. I do. I do understand that. I've been through it. God has a purpose for you. Your disappointment with God might actually be a divine appointment from God. So what happened? Caesar Augustus issues this decree, and everyone has to go back to their hometown to get counted. This is a 90-mile trip for Joe and Mary. This is not cute. This is not fun. If, when you're looking at your coffee table, you need to just recognize the pain of a pregnant woman riding on a donkey's spine for a week. All right? Come on, ladies. This ain't fun at all. All right? That's like marriage ending, all right? Have you ever traveled anywhere with your pregnant wife? This is not, this is not gonna go well. I, I, I can't imagine. I don't care if there's leather seats. I don't care if there's air conditioning. I'll go myself, get the experience, bring it home to my wife because this is like, this is gonna be mission critical. We are not going anywhere together. But they have to go 90 miles back to their hometown. No work, that means no pay. All right, they didn't have like stimulus checks back then. There's pressure on Joe right here to travel through the Judean desert, which is frozen at night. It's frozen at night. Uh, one of the most terrifying parts of this journey would have been the, the, the valley of the Jordan River. This is a place where uh, robbers and pirates would lay in wait for people traveling just like this. They would have to fight off lions right there, bears, wild boars. Like wild boars, are you kidding me? That's terrifying. You ever seen a wild boar? Ugh. Like, ugh, turn into bacon. Jeez, I don't want to even look at you right now. See, that's scary. You're trying to fight a wild boar? Like, if you fought a wild boar, you win. Like, you just, whatever you, whatever you say, like, I'll just shake your hand, all right? I'm like, you're good. Wild boar, that's just scary to me. I don't know what. It's like, spiders for my wife, wild boar for me. I'm, I'm terrified of that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do it. All of that on a donkey with a very pregnant wife. So they get to Nazareth. There's no such thing as hotels.com. There's no room for them. And, and over a week on a donkey's back, Mary is having contractions by now. Joe is freaking out. He's negotiating this barn deal. And it's not a barn, everybody. It's not a barn. They're not staying in some barn. What do you think this is? Like HGTV? Like this, like some shiplap barn they're going to stay in? What do you think this is? Dude, this is, this is Nazareth. Or Bethlehem. This is like 2,000 years ago. They didn't have nice stuff. All right? Google, Google where Jesus was born. Uh, like just go ahead and look for yourself. This is like nasty, dirty, side of a cave, horse poop right there, a little bit of like whatever. And it's, it's, this is terrible. This is a terrible experience they're going through. Uh, horrible birthing experience. Dirty shepherds showing up as soon as baby's born. These dirty shepherds are all like, can I hold the baby? Ugh. Like, heck of creepy. Like, get out of here. Who are you? Who are these shepherds right now? 
Like, here I am, I'm going, like, this is, Joe, get them out of here. Get them out of here. No one invited them. And, and Herod wants to kill all the babies now. The king wants to kill all babies. What is going on in life? This is outrageous. Everything that could have possibly gone wrong is going wrong right now. They're running for their lives. Imagine this is you. All because you said yes to God. Okay. All right. Yeah, Christianity sounds great, Pastor. I cannot wait to sign up, be a member of your church. Yes, let's get this party started. When can I start? All right. When does the suffering start? All right, when can we do some persecution stuff you keep talking about? It's fun to laugh about, but like, this is terrible. This is absolutely, this is garbage. All because of obeying a peace on earth. All of our songs too, they're so nice about this season. They're so friendly and everything's so, all is calm, all is bright. This is hell on earth. Are you kidding me? This is, this is a tragedy. Even when, even when the baby's born, this is, this is out, this, it's not good. It's not good. Peace on earth. Give me a break, man. This is hell on earth. And let's, let's, let's really zoom in here. Let's fast forward 30 years. Mary says yes to God. They have this baby. Fast forward 30 years. Her son's hanging on a cross, beaten so bad, he's unrecognizable. He's beaten to a pulp for, for nothing, for nothing. He's never hurt anybody. This is, imagine, I'm, I'm trying to put you in, this is your baby. Think about it. This is your child who you said yes to all those years ago, three decades ago, you said yes to God. And he showed up for you and your plan. This is still the plan. Like everything's going good, right? Everything's going good. 30 years later, this must be great, right? 30 years in, he gets persecuted. He gets arrested. And now he's up there on that cross. And and mom is having to watch him as they torture him, as they beat him. He's never done anything wrong to anybody. I know know y'all love your babies. Everybody loves their baby. Everybody thinks their baby's the best baby and everybody else's baby is like not a good baby, but your baby's a good baby. (laughs) This baby was the savior of the world. This baby literally never sinned, never hurt anybody, only did good things for people, only helped people, only cared, only gave his life, only did everything so that everyone else could only have hope in in their life. And she looks up at him as he's getting beaten, as he's being wrongly accused, and watches him die. He dies. We have the privilege of hindsight to look back and say, oh, it's only three days. How do you think that three days felt? There wasn't anybody that thought it was going good. All the disciples ran off. Everybody did. Everyone was like, no, this is it. We're, we're done. We, we were wrong. We were wrong. Plan failed. But God had a purpose. Even in death, God had a purpose. God, there's nothing he can't turn around, is there? There's nothing he can't do. There's nothing he can't flip around. I think that's the best picture for whatever you're going through. Whatever death you've experienced in your life, whatever tragedy you've experienced in your life, whatever plan didn't come to fruition, there is nothing that God can't accomplish. There is nothing he can't turn around for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If we would just believe him, if we would just come to him and say, God, I believe you, I trust you, I believe in you, oh, God. What, what, is it, what is it gonna take for us to believe that God can do something with us in our situation, not just hers, our situation? As he's suffering, he says, Father, forgive them. I commit my spirit into your hands. He dies. You don't have to understand God's plan to trust he has a purpose. The story of Christmas, no one could have planned it. 
No one would have planned it this way. That God would become a man that he would be conceived by the Holy Spirit, that he would be born and wrapped in swaddling cloths, the same kind of cloths that wrapped dead people, the same kind of cloths he was wrapped in when he died only 33 years later. A sign that the same cloths were used to, to, to bring him into this world would take him out. It's a foreshadowing of the Savior being born to die, but being born to be born again. The first one, born again, raised to life so that we can be too. Mary and Joseph had a plan for their lives. And it was a good plan. And they were good people. But God had a purpose. Let me tell you what that purpose was. That purpose was you. It's you. That you would be here that you would have an opportunity for hope, for healing, for forgiveness. That's his purpose. Even though they had a good plan, no, God had an even better purpose. His purpose was you, that you could be made right, that you could be made new, that you could be restored. That's his purpose. Listen to Matthew 1. Mary will give birth to a son, And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So if you had a change in plans, a change in your life that you don't understand, disappointment, just the name of this message today, disappointment, dealing with disappointment. Your disappointment with God might actually be a divine appointment from God. Many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord's purpose is prevails. That's the story of Christmas, is that even when life is upside down, even when your life is absolutely thrashed, trashed, kicked on the curb, God can use it. In fact, God might be, God might be using that exact pain to do something that you just can't imagine. I hope you can see it. I pray you can see it. I hope this Christmas and this message right here, right now, changes your mindset to be able to see God can use this pain. He can use this hurt. He can use this suffering. All it takes is trust. That's all Mary and Joseph had to do. Trust God. That's all you need to do too.